Okay, see who is here. Austin, Imasen, Sally, Imasen, Mo, Cassie, also. Jerry had to give me grief. No Jaren. And Shade is here. Okay, so the people I'm missing are Austin, Sally, Cassie, and Jaren. Now, as requested, we'll drop back another lecture in our schedule and instead do some review um, just to make sure that it's not lost for Wednesday. Complete concept coach through, I have it here so I can read it, 25.6 for Wednesday. Um, if you want to get any modicum of credit at all for um, 24, 23, or 22, that would have to be done by tomorrow. Obviously, they were due earlier, but... I'm giving some credit if it's done before the test. So the test is over only three chapters, chapters 22, 23, and 24. And so let's look at what we had there. So chapter 22, that's where we introduced magnetism. So obviously you need to know that there is a north pole and a south pole. The north pole is the north seeking. And when it says north seeking, it means it seeks the geographic north. But it turns out that opposites attract, just like it was with electric charge. So a north magnetic pole is attracted to a south magnetic pole, which means that the Earth's north geographic pole must be a south magnetic pole. A very important discovery in magnetism is that magnets always come as a dipole with a net magnetic charge of zero. That means they always come with as much north as they have south, so that the net magnetic charge is always zero. Hence, Gauss's law for magnetism is useless to us. No matter what your volume is, it always has a net magnetic charge of zero and doesn't do much good for us. Then we have the magnetic fields. Magnetic field lines always come out of the north pole and go into the south pole of a magnet. And the magnet field lines are always closed loops. Now, we've already studied fields. We studied things like electric fields, gravitational fields before that. What's the purpose of a field? Yeah, they're there to help us describe the forces. And it was very clear to see with, magnet, or with gravity, so clear that we never even talked much about it being a gravitational force field. When we talked about the electric field, then I said, okay, well, the electric field is a force field analogous to the gravitational field and try to bring it back to the gravity to make it more comfortable. Now when we get to the magnetic field, the ideas we learned for the electric field are still applicable. That is, the closer the lines are, the stronger the, the force field. But the force itself is more bizarre. The... There is a torque if you put a magnet in a magnetic field to try to make the magnet align with the external magnetic field. And we've gone through and talked about electric motors that are taking advantage of that. But the force between moving charges is more, well, more difficult. So let's look at the force acting on charges moving in a magnetic field. So you have to have a charge moving a magnetic field for there to be a magnetic force on it. That equation, of course, it will be given. Is QV cross B. What does it mean if I have a cross product, a V cross B? Multiplying the perpendicular parts. What direction is the result? You use the right hand rule. Anytime you have a cross product, you use that right hand rule where the index finger of your right hand points in the direction of the first item in the cross product, the middle finger of your right hand 
points to the second one in the cross product, and the thumb points in the direction of the answer. Now I'm going to put thumb here, but there's kind of one caveat because it's not force is equal to v cross b, it's force is equal to q v cross b. If q is negative, then it would flip the direction because the thumb is for the answer of the cross product. If q is negative, it'll flip it. So you should be able to apply the right hand rule. And keep in mind your answer, your force, is always perpendicular to the velocity of the charge and also always perpendicular to the magnetic field. What happens if the particle is moving parallel to the magnetic field? No force. Force of zero because it's the product of the perpendicular components. Now that was the first equation we learned. That was for the force on a charge moving a magnetic field. But you can also take this and say, well, I don't want to talk about charge moving a magnetic field. I want to talk about a current in a magnetic field. And so we had the equivalent equation for current moving in a magnetic field. So you should be able to use either one interchangeably, since they really mean the same thing. So you should be able to find the force on charge moving in a magnetic field. And from that, we can do things like, remember, we had mass spectrometer where we're using something's going in a circular arc, so the net force toward the center has to be mv squared over r, and we could find a relationship between the charge and the radius and the mass. We also had the Hall effect. Everybody should remember the Hall effect. We had at least one homework problem with the Hall effect. The Hall effect is the effect where we have current going through, instead of saying a wire, we say something that has a measurable you know, separation between one side and the other. And if it's in a magnetic field, this magnetic force equation is going to make charge move up or down depending if it's positive charge or negative charge. And because that charge moves up or down depending on if it's positive or negative charge, you develop an electric field that is proportional to the the velocity and the magnetic fields. And so from that we actually took the equation if I have a current flowing through here and a magnetic field like that then force is equal to IL cross B. So if my current is going this direction, I would take my right hand, put my fingers in my right hand in that direction, or in my hand like this, and my thumb points up. What does it mean if my thumb points up? Wait, what? Okay, yes, but I'm sure this is my hearing here. I'm sure she said the same thing three times. <laughs> okay, so we would have a force that's pushing charge carriers upward. But if I push the charge carriers upward, here's something that's interesting. If it's positive charge carriers, then the top would become positively charged. If it's negative charge carriers, the bottom would become negative, or the top would be negative charged, the bottom would be positive. So the side that's positive actually depends on if it's a positive charge carrier or a negative charge carrier. In a normal wire, what's the charge carrier? It's electrons. So in a normal wire, I would have electrons pushed up here. But if we use some semiconductors, we find that I have the positive charge up here instead of the negative charge, which means that in those semiconductors, it's actually positive charge that's moving. And that gets real confusing because where's the positive charge in atoms? In the nucleus. Well, it's certainly not the nuclei of the atoms that are cruising through the wire. 
And so the conclusion is it's what we call electron holes. A hole is a place where there should be an electron and there's not. And they say you have hole migration to make the current. What's really happening with the hole migration is you have a hole that moves this way because the electrons are constantly hopping that way. Okay, so we have that force and it creates a voltage difference. So if it was a negative charge carrier, I'd have my negative voltage up here. Whoops, that's not a negative sign. A negative voltage up here and a positive voltage down there. And the charge will stop moving up when I have a force due to the electric field that is equal magnitude to the force of the magnetic field. So the force due to the electric field, right, we can't forget this, is QE. And so I set those equal to each other when... So instead of equilibrium, that is, it'll stop building more electric field when that is true. And so I can calculate what the electric field will be. Now, we usually have written this, instead of ILB, we've written it as QVB, right, using the other equation for the force on moving charge. And so then we can find a relationship. The electric field has to be equal to the velocity multiplied by the magnetic field, which is an equation that comes back in chapter 24 about electromagnetic waves. So all of this is the Hall effect. We have that electric field difference. The last thing we did with the Hall effect was finding the voltage difference. Voltage difference is electric field dotted with distance. Well, the electric field is going to clearly be vertical in my picture. And so if I move from the top to the bottom, that will be parallel with the distance. And so it turns out the voltage difference in this case, where the electric field is parallel to the distance, it's just the electric field times, um, I'll call it L, and then specify L is that distance. And so we get a voltage difference that we can measure and relate to what the voltage, or excuse me, the velocity and the magnetic field are. Yes? Okay, in, in the case where I switch to this equation, that velocity is the velocity of the charge carrier. Okay, electric motors. Electric motors are, you need to just be able to use your geometry, use your torque equation, and your electric force equation to combine those to find the net torque created by wires in a magnetic field. And so then you should be able to go from that and talk about, okay, so if I change the angle, then I'm going to have the torque changing because torque is R cross F and be able to go through the calculations for an electric motor. Brings us to Ampere's law. The, the point of Amps, Ampere's law is, to, is that a current creates a magnetic field. If I have a current that's going through a wire, it's going to create a magnetic field. How do I find the direction of that magnetic field? I have a right-hand rule for a current in a wire, I put there Ampere's law. But for a current in a wire, I have a right-hand rule, point my thumb in the direction of the current, and my fingers wrapping around the wire telling me the direction of the magnetic field. And just like we learned before, the magnetic fields have to form closed loops. So they have to come around on themselves. You should be able to use Ampere's law both for a single wire that's very long and for a solenoid. Remember, a solenoid, a whole bunch of loops of wire. And for the solenoid, I had to use a path that goes to the center, or, well, let me just draw a picture for the solenoid. For the solenoid, 
I made my loop something like this where one part of the loop is inside of the solenoid where I have the magnetic field inside. The sides that are vertical are going to be perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. So the B dot L is zero on the sides. And the top is so far away that the magnetic field very far away is zero. Now, I didn't write Ampere's law. We kind of need to write it down. Ampere's law says, <laughs> sorry. The sum of magnetic field dotted to length on a closed loop doesn't have to be a loop that's a wire. It has to be a closed loop that you're using for calculation, just like when we use Gauss's law with the surface, is equal to the permeability of free space multiplied by the current enclosed by that loop. We use Ampere's law only when we have a nice useful symmetry, which is just the two cases I mentioned. For a straight wire, in which case you have circles going around, are always going to have the magnetic field parallel to the length as you go around, or the solenoid that I just described. Then we have the right-hand rule for the solenoid. How is the right-hand rule for the solenoid different than the right-hand rule for a wire? The solenoid comes from the wire, so you can actually just use the one for the wire for a solenoid, but it's a lot more convenient to use the one for a solenoid. Since no one has answered, if you take a solenoid and you wrap your fingers in the direction the current is going around in the loops, so from the, your perspective, this should be a clockwise current. So I take my right hand, I wrap my fingers in the clockwise direction, my thumb points away from you. That means the magnetic field in the center of the solenoid is pointing away from you. Now, since magnetic field lines always form loops, what else does that tell you about the direction of the magnetic field? Outside, outside. outside, it's going the opposite direction. So they can form loops. So thumb is the direction of the magnetic field in the center of the solenoid. Fingers are the direction that the current is going in loops in the solenoid. So that's the right-hand rule for the solenoid. I know it can get confusing because we now have three right-hand rules we're paying attention to. One for cross products, one for a current carrying wire, and one for current in the solenoid. So you have to make sure you keep them separate, and always remember it is the right hand. Okay, the last thing here is the force between two current carrying wires. And one tricky thing about that is it's always the force per unit length. Because if I have two infinite wires, the force between them is going to be infinite. But I do the force per length, and then I don't have to worry about it. If I have two current carrying wires, I just take the first wire, find the magnetic field it creates at the position of the second wire, and then use that magnetic field at the second wire and the equation for force of a wire in a magnetic field to get the force. All right. Next to last of my slides. Chapter 23. We had Faraday's law of induction. Faraday's law of induction said that a changing magnetic flux will induce an EMF. And so we have the equation for Faraday's law of induction that says the EMF induced is equal to minus N change in magnetic flux over change in time. So you should be able to calculate the magnetic flux, be able to analyze the change in magnetic flux. Now, let me take some simple examples. Let us suppose that I have a constant magnetic field that's pointing straight down into the table. What happens to the magnitude of the flux if I have a coil and it gets bigger? The flux stay the same, grow or decrease as the area got bigger of the loop. I only saw one person, that's what I pointed. You're right. What, what did you say? 
Okay, what is flux? While flux, I actually looked it up again last week just to make sure. Flux comes from fluxion, which is, oh boy, I have to go through it again. I don't remember. It always confuses me. But the flux is measuring how much magnetic field goes through the surface. Or if it was electric flux, it's how much electric field goes through the surface. The way we calculate that is magnetic field dotted to the area of the surface. So if the area gets bigger, what happens to magnetic field dotted to area? It increases. So if the area gets bigger in my loop, then the flux increases. Now according to Faraday's law of induction, if the flux is increased in time, that's going to induce an EMF in my coil. What direction will the induced EMF be? Okay, it's going to be the direction that resists the change in magnetic flux. So I gave the example that my magnetic field was going down into the table. So the magnetic field is going down to the table and the area gets bigger. The flux is getting bigger pointing down. So to counter a getting bigger pointing down, keep it constant. Which you're right. What direction does the induced magnetic field have to point? All right. I see three people all pointing up. It has to oppose the change. The change was getting bigger down, so it had to make one up. How do I find the direction the current is going to flow then if it's making a magnetic field that's up in that coil? You use the right hand rule for a solenoid. Point my thumb in the direction I need the magnetic field in the center to be, which is up. My fingers wrap around and tell me the direction the induced current is going to be. So we, well, I don't. You need to, for tomorrow's test, be able to go through these kinds of calculations. So we just applied Lenz's law, and we applied a situation where the area was changing. If instead of having the area change, I went from having the coil like this to having the coil like this, in terms of the coil, it started with a flux magnetic field going this direction. It ended with no flux, so what direction was the change in flux? Okay, the flux was decreasing, so from my initial position, that would have been a change upward. Right? It was rotating, so it's a little more difficult. But if it's a change that is upward, Lenz's law says my induced EMF has to oppose that change, so what direction would the induced magnetic field have to point? The same direction I started, right hand rule tells me the direction that the current has to flow. So changing the orientation of your coil results in a changing magnetic flux. Changing the size of your coil results in a changing magnetic flux. And finally, of course, you could change the strength of the magnetic, strength of the magnetic field. An example would be when we talked about eddy currents and I have a magnet falling down. You get closer to the magnet, the magnetic field increases in strength, so the flux is getting bigger, and the induced EMF has to oppose that change and so you end up with the region where the magnetic field is getting bigger. You have an induced magnetic field that's opposing it dropping. So that's what eddy currents were about. Make sure you understand them. Electric generators. Electric generators are just taking advantage of Faraday's law of induction. You just take a coil with a known area, and you rotate that coil, and you're going to have the flux constantly changing. Your flux. would be B A, let's say, sine of omega T. And if your flux is B A sine of omega T, then the change in flux with change in time is omega B A cosine of omega T. Now, if you start with cosine, you end up with sine. If you start with sine, you end up with cosine. So your flux 
change is like that, and of course, your EMF that's induced has multiplied by N. What's the purpose of that minus sign? Yeah. It basically reminds me to look at Lenz's law. So I don't ever put that minus sign in my equations. I look at Lenz's law. Now transformers, more than meets the eye. What does a transformer do in a circuit? It allows you to change the voltage if you have an AC circuit. If it's DC, what does a transformer do? Nada. A transformer is a short name for the longer name of a mutual inductor. Mutual inductor means that you have one coil and it's coupled to another coil. How do you couple it? Well, very often you couple it by putting a piece of iron that goes through one coil and then goes through a second coil. And so that iron makes it so the magnetic field generated by the first coil goes through the second coil. And if the magnetic field is fluctuating, then Faraday's law of induction says it's going to induce a voltage in the second coil. And so it's Faraday's law of induction combined with um, Ampere's law that tells us about the magnetic field produced in a solenoid that makes this mutual inductor produce an output voltage when you put an input voltage in. For an ideal transformer, V1 over V2 is equal to N1 over N2 is equal to current 2 over current 1. That is, if you step up the voltage, you'll step down the current. If you step down the voltage, you'll step up the current. And we use these for our power such as this. The power going across the country is somewhere in the ballpark of 400 kilovolts. Big voltage fluctuations. The voltage that we have coming out here is 120 volts. Now these are measured in RMS. At this point, you should understand how the RMS works, right? For the last test, we hadn't covered anything RMS. But now we do, so you should be able to do that calculus actually on the coming up slide. The next slide. It's left to have it. Um, <clears throat> why do we have a high voltage for a transmission across the country? It reduces the power loss. Because the power lost through a resistor is I squared over R, the bigger the I, the bigger the power loss for the resistor. But if you can go to a very high voltage and a very low current, you'll have a low power loss through the resistance of the wires. Okay, the last thing I have on this slide is inductors. Inductors are, instead of mutual inductors, self-inductors. So oftentimes, we don't write this, but it's self-inductors. Doing the same thing as a transformer except on itself. You put current in, it creates a magnetic field. But as the magnetic field is building, you have an EMF induced. And an inductor stores energy. And remember, we went through it stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. And it will return that energy. And we even went from there to calculate the energy density, how much energy is stored in a magnetic field. Now the circuits. We have the reactants. A new word that's not the same as resistance, but has a similar feel to it. Resistance was a measurement that told us about how much work would be required to force charge through a resistor. Reactance tells us about how much work is going to be required to force charge through an inductor or capacitor with one difference. The inductor or capacitor will return that energy, whereas the resistor, that energy was dissipated as heat. So the reason we don't call it resistance is because for reactances, for inductors and capacitors, they're going to give the energy back. That's why we have a different word for it. 
And then we had the inductive reactants was X sub L is equal to omega L. The capacitive reactants, X sub C is equal to one over omega C. So you can relate what the reactance is to the frequency. Remember omega is the angular frequency, omega is two pi F, of your AC signal. If you have a DC signal, a direct current, what is the frequency? How many times does it cycle in a second? If it's DC, how many times is it cycling in a second? None, right? It's not cycling. So its frequency would be zero. And so if you had a DC circuit, your inductive reactants, XL, would just be zero. Well, that corresponds to the ideal resistance of the wire, right? An inductor is a wire that's looped up. If you have a DC circuit, you don't have anything going on in terms of the inductor doing anything, and you just have a wire. So that makes great sense. For the capacitor, 1 over 0, that's infinite, right? That also makes perfect sense, because the capacitor is two plates that don't touch each other. You don't have any connection between the two, your resistance should be approaching infinity. So that capacitive reactance approaching infinity in the case of DC makes perfect sense. Impedance is combining the resistance and the capacitance together into one term that's telling you how the circuit is going to respond when you have charge going through it. You need to be able to take these ideas and then solve alternating current circuits like we did in lab. Was it last week? So you should be able to shift back and forth between RMS and peak values only using sinusoids. So if it's a sinusoid, it's a simple shift. For a sinusoid, V peak is equal to the square root of 2 V RMS. So it's not hard to shift back and forth if it's sinusoidal and what we're going to be doing is sinusoidal. You need to know the average power versus the apparent power. Remember, that was part of the lab that you just finished. You had calculating the phase angle, which is also called, called the power factor angle. Cosine of that phase angle is, angle is called the power factor because it tells you the relationship between the average power and the apparent power. The apparent power is VRMS IRMS. And the average power is equal to the apparent power times cosine of that power factor angle. And remember, we talked about, ideally, you would like that power factor angle to be 0. So cosine of 0 is 1. So that the average power, what you're actually using, is the same as the apparent power, which is what you're getting charged for. Right? Ideally, you don't get charged for more than you use. If this angle, if phi is not 0, let's say it's 30 degrees, then cosine 30 degrees is 0.866. And you are going to be paying for 1 divided by 0.866, which I don't know. I don't remember that number offhand. But it's bigger than 1. So you're going to be paying for more than the power you're actually using. And phasor diagrams. The biggest time consumer for the lab this week was those phasor diagrams. You should understand them. OK, last week, the last one you did. You should understand those phasor diagrams so that you can explain things or draw as necessary. And my last slide, chapter 24. Chapter 24 is a transitional chapter, if you will. It's transitioning from electromagnetism to electromagnetic waves. Light being an example of electromagnetic waves. So everything after that, we dealt primarily with light. So chapter 25, we start with light. But this was showing the relationship. Now, historically, 
you don't have this transition. It wasn't until around 1880s to 1890s that you would have this transition. Before that, optics was just completely different from electricity magnetism. But when Maxwell was able to combine, remember, there are two different times that he published works on this, one cutting down to 20 equations, and then, what, nine years later or something, down to only four equations. Those four equations describe all of electricity magnetism. And he said, hey, these four equations predict that there should be electromagnetic waves, and they predict a speed. Now, in my lecture, I didn't get to the part on predicting the speed. So I'm just going to write the key portion of that. I'm not going to do the derivation or anything. What Maxwell determined, I will tomorrow, by the way, if you want to come to the Physics 252 class. What Maxwell determined, or Clerk Maxwell, is that the speed of light in vacuum should be 1 divided by the square root of the permittivity of free space times the permeability of free space. Now, of course, he didn't say the speed of light in vacuum. He said the speed of an electromagnetic wave. But he found that when he calculated that, it gave him the speed of light in vacuum. And he made that connection, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. If it has the same speed, it must be the same thing, which is really poor logic, but turned out to be correct. So Maxwell, Clerk Maxwell correctly predicted electromagnetic waves. And correctly predicted that electromagnetic waves and light were the same thing, but his reason for that second part, not so good. So we have those four Maxwell's equations. The first two, Gauss's law, which tells us about the force between electric charges, and Gauss's law for magnetism, a little less useful to us. The third one, Faraday's law of induction, which has a real key thing here. Changing magnetic flux produces electric field. Now, Ampere's law only had to do with current creating a magnetic field. But Clark Maxwell realized that there was a problem there. You could draw your picture differently and get a different result. And thus, he came up with this idea of a displacement current. Displacement current being a current that was effectively in place when you're charging a capacitor. And with that change, Ampere's law says that a changing electric flux produces a magnetic field. And it's that key. A changing electric field produces a magnetic field. Changing magnetic field produces an electric field that predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. And by putting these equations together, Clerk Maxwell found that you have to have a transverse wave. What does it mean for a wave to be a transverse wave? The direction of the propagation is perpendicular to the direction of the displacement. So for instance, a transverse wave on a string, if the string goes from me to Chad, the displacements have to be perpendicular to the distance from me to Chad for it to be a transverse wave. So it's a transverse wave with electric and magnetic fields. And at any time, the electric field is minus. I actually went back to a slide before we introduced. I had it right, a slide from the lecture before. I had it right in that slide. Um, minus the velocity crossed with the magnetic field. But there's a further restriction on this. When you have a cross product, you always have the answer has to be perpendicular to both of the two things in the cross product. But the two things in the cross product don't have to be perpendicular. They just have to have perpendicular components. Well, for an electromagnetic wave, all three have to be perpendicular. None of them have any parallel parts. So the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field and the velocity. Velocity is perpendicular to the electric and magnetic fields. Works all the way around. And so you can get your directions using the right-hand rule with that equation in the box. And at any moment, the electric field 
is just linearly proportional to the magnetic field. And the constant proportionality is C. What is C? Speed of the speed of light and vacuum. Now, I put this with C. The equation right before it had V. The one that has C is assuming you're in vacuum. If you're not in vacuum, it's not going to be C. It's going to be V. But I wanted to make sure I put C in here so I could talk about the speed of light in vacuum. Speed of light in anything else is slower than the speed of light in vacuum. Finally, you should know the basics of the electromagnetic spectrum. You should know that the longest wavelengths are going to be your radio waves. And that for radio waves, you go to microwaves, microwaves to infrared, infrared to visible, starting with red, ending with violet. From violet, you go to ultraviolet. And you should know the rough wavelengths and or frequencies for the transitions. Now, I said rough because they are rough. There is not a fix. This is the cutoff. You're never going to find out because it doesn't exist. But you should have rough values for the range for radio waves. Right? Radio waves go, if you just think about the radio dial, you have frequencies that go from around 500 kilohertz up to around 100 megahertz on your radio dials, AM and FM. And so that gives you a ballpark for that range. It's not the entire range for radio, but it gives you a ballpark. And then infrared, well, microwaves, yeah, just make sure you look up what ballparks are for microwaves. And for infrared, visible, make sure you know those. That is what I had for review. I'm eight minutes early. Fire away with questions. Or don't. The other option is to walk up and, or stand up and walk out. <laughs> yeah, Terry. Going back to the um, Hall effect thing. Yeah. Uh, can, can you explain one more time what the velocity there was? Is that the velocity of the moving rod or the velocity of the... Um, if you use the equation Q, V cross B, then the V is the velocity of the charge carrier. If you use Li cross B, well, then it's a different thing. You don't have to worry about the velocity. Right, so if you use that form, you have to know about the drift velocity and things like that. So it's more complicated if you get down to it. Yes, Diksha. I don't have you know, time to go through the full problem like I did in class, but let's just take it at the simple. It turns out that the torque for an electric motor is equal to, obviously, the sum of the torques and the sides, right? And so if we make a square and we are rotating about this axis, then torque is equal to R cross F. So I'm going to need to find the forces on the sides that will have force perpendicular to the radius. I would have a radius like this out to this side, a radius like this out to that side. The radius for this wire here will be changing as I go through it, right? But if we look at the forces, if my magnetic field is going like this, then the forces that I'm going to get are going to be just using your right hand and the equation that force is equal to, well, let's go with I L cross B. If my current is going like that, And on the first side you come to, take my right hand, my fingers. This is supposed to be, this is coming out toward you. Okay, this is my best drawing of this coming toward you. So this is coming out toward you. Got to orient my hand so my middle fingers can point the direction of the magnetic field. 
and that's an upward force. And so I'm going to have force one is going up. If I go to the, this side here, my current is now going away from you, or in my hand so my fingers can point in the direction of my field, and it's down. So I have force two like that. Uh-oh. Did your screen, or did you see the screen flash, or is that just mine? Okay, I'm not sure what happened. On this side here, this here is supposed to be parallel to that, right? That's the bad of Richard's drawing. If they're parallel, then the force is L cross B, where L and B are parallel, is zero. So I'd have zero force on the ends. So my total force, as we said before, is going to be zero because I have the same length here as I have there. So the total force is zero. But the total torque, if we call the lengths, and I'm just <clears throat> trying to follow what the book did, call this length A and this length B, then the sum of the torques is going to be, for the forces we'll have I, A, B for the magnitudes. It's going to be that for the first one and that for the second one. And the direction, of course, I didn't show directions on the right hand of the equal sign, but there is a direction. If I use my right hand rule just with one R1, which is that way, across the force is into the board. R2, that way, across the force, it's also into the board. So both of those are into the board. And so I end up with the sum of the torques, and I'm just going to draw, put the magnitude now. If I add these two together, one half plus one half is one, and it's I B times A B. Uh, that's lowercase B, which is current times magnetic field times the area of the loop. Now, there's one last thing that I did not put in here, and that is as your um, coil rotates, the angles are no longer going to be 90 degrees between the R and the F. And so you actually have to throw in there as well a sine theta. I didn't show the sine theta because I just did it for sine theta equal 1. So the total torque would look like that. If I have multiple coils, I have to multiply by N. So the torque net equals NBA sine of, and we put omega T because we're, of course, going to have it rotate. Okay. That does take us to the end of time. I will see you all tomorrow for the exam.